Okay, let's get started. See, I had a couple of comments uh, in response to things that came up on the discussion board. One was uh, when you do GLS or GEE, um, you get these estimates of the correlation coefficient. So like when we did um, compound symmetric correlation structure and we did GLS or GEE, part of the output from those functions includes an estimate of the correlation coefficient rho. So there was a good question about um, what if we wanted to do inference on rho? We're used to seeing uh, estimates and standard deviations for regression coefficients. So if you wanted to test a null hypothesis that some beta coefficient, beta 2, is equal to 0, then we know we can do estimate divided by the SD of the estimate and treat that as a test statistic. So we could compare that under the null hypothesis to either a T or a Z if we had a large sample size. So I'll just say T in minus P. Um, but it's also, you know, an, an interesting question. If you have, if you think you have correlated data, we could let GLS or GEE estimate rho. We have an estimate of rho in the output. How could I assess whether rho is really uh, not zero? Um, GEE and GLS don't give us a standard deviation of rho. But this is a place where the bootstrap can be used, can be handy. Um, in particular, if we did bootstrap, we would have to sample with replacement from the individuals like we've been doing with correlated data. So we'd have to sample chunks of rows that correspond to individuals. And then for each bootstrap sample, we could refit the model and get the estimated row. So if I did a bootstrap analysis for 1,000 bootstrap iterations, I could refit the model each time, get an estimate of row each time, and then you'd have a sampling distribution of row. So bootstrap would allow us pretty easily to get a confidence interval for row. And then you could check is zero contained in the interval? And that would be statistical inference, essentially doing a hypothesis test for whether there is any correlation in the data, any non-zero correlation. Um, what was the other question? Uh, we know, or we have seen in, in class and in your assignments, how to use the bootstrap for regression generally. What we have used it for so far is confidence intervals. So for example, if we had a model and we wanted to have a confidence interval for some uh, beta coefficient or a sum of beta coefficients, beta 0 plus beta 2, say, or the 12-year-old girl example and, and the other one of our data sets, we could sample with replacement, refit the model each time, and get a confidence interval for any function of the betas that we want. That's for a confidence interval. If you want a hypothesis test. So if we wanted to use bootstrap to do a hypothesis test and compute a p-value, there's a little bit of an extra step involved. We saw earlier on in the semester when we talked about bootstrap um, inference that if you want a confidence interval, you just sample with replacement from your data, recompute whatever it is you're estimating, and store it. That gives you a sampling distribution from which you can get confidence interval. And if you want to do a test, the 
prerequisite is that you transform the data to force the null hypothesis to be true. So for example, if we just had univariate data and we wanted to test is the mean in this population equal to such and such, before doing the resampling, we would transform the data to make it have mean such and such. That's because a p-value is a probability when the null hypothesis is true. Suppose we had a regression model like this one, beta 0 plus beta 1 xi plus beta 2 zi. And suppose we wanted to test a null hypothesis um, let's just consider the null hypothesis that beta 2 is equal to 0. We, are, we know how to do that in a, in a walled test kind of way, estimate divided by SD, we could do that. But we could also use the bootstrap. If I wanted to use the bootstrap to compute a p-value for a regression model, uh, let me point you to some notes that we saw a while back. Our regression notes. I didn't cover this slide in lecture, so let me let me briefly comment on it. This describes what you would do to compute a p-value with the bootstrap in the context of regression. And again, it's analogous to what we saw in the simpler cases where you transform the data to force the null to be true. So if we have a regression model, which we can generically write down as y equal x beta plus epsilon, and there's some null hypothesis of having to do with the coefficients that corresponds to a uh, restricted or null model, y equal x zero beta zero plus epsilon. So those would be, in the context of um, the whiteboard, the null model, the null model would just be yi equals beta 0 plus beta 1 xi. And z is not in there anymore because under the null it's not. So in the language of that slide, we would say this is y equal x beta plus epsilon. And we would say this is y equal x zero beta zero plus epsilon. So the way that we would proceed is that uh, we need to, we need to like simulate data from that null model. We need to generate bootstrap samples as if they came from the null model. And what, the way we can do that is to sample uh, the residuals with replacement. Instead of sampling rows of our uh, data, response and predictors, we can sample residuals. We can do this even for the confidence interval application. There's two ways to do bootstrap with regression, two common ways. One is to sample, like we've been doing, rows of the data. But an equivalent, not exactly equivalent, but uh, theoretically justifiably uh, comparable way is to sample the residuals. Um, so let me show you. It's easier to see in the confidence interval application. If I wanted a confidence interval for um, some function of the betas, we could fit the model. Let's fit the original model, beta 0 plus beta 1 and beta 2 plus epsilon. Once we fit this model, we have estimates of the beta coefficients. We have estimates of the residuals as well, because the residuals are just truth minus fitted. So one way to bootstrap um, is to sample with replacement from the 
Epsilon I hats. Then add those back to the fitted values from the model. So it's now that we have a bootstrap sample, YI, let's say tilde, the beef bootstrap sample, is fitted values from the model plus resampled residuals. So it's like we're, we're preserving that original model that we fit, and all we're doing is kind of shuffling or resampling, simulating from the residual distribution. That yi tilde b would still have the same covariates as individual i. The only thing that has changed is the response value is now a little different from the original. But it works the same way. You can redo this many times and then get a valid confidence interval. If I want a hypothesis test, then what I want to do, so for a hypothesis test, what I want to do is take the fitted values under the null model and add to them the resampled residuals. This is what we want to do because this is, this is like analogous to simulating from the null model. If I go to the fitted values under the null model and I add in these resampled residuals, I get back like a simulated version of our data under the null model. And now the sampling distribution that we get after doing the bootstrapping is a null sampling distribution. Um, so I'm not going to test you on that, but I did want to mention it because it came up on the discussion board. You can use the bootstrap for regression for both confidence intervals and p-values, but if you're going to use the bootstrap to compute a p-value, you first have to do this a uh, little bit of a, a fix at the beginning to ensure that you're getting um, realizations of the statistic under the null hypothesis. That's the key. It's easier to do the sampling of um, response and rows of the design matrix because you don't have to do this transformation thing. And remember that a confidence interval can be used in place of a p-value by just asking whether the null value is contained in the confidence interval. So arguably, you don't have to ever do this, um, but it is, it is an option. If you read a book on bootstrap, when they discuss bootstrapping for regression, they'll, they'll uh, paint these two possibilities, sample the, res um, the response and the corresponding rows of the design matrix, or sample from the residuals. There are a couple of minor points that, that give one some benefits over the other. Uh, sampling the residuals, for example, has stronger dependence on the model itself being correct. Because you're using the model more directly in the, in the routine. Sampling just the response and the rows of the design matrix is more uh, it, it has less attachment to assumptions of the model. So I think it's more generally recommended. Okay, what I wanted to start in on today is survival analysis, working with censored data. So let's think about what censored data looks like. Survival analysis uh, originally grew out of um, applications of time to event, like time to death, time to failure of a, of a device or something. So it doesn't have to be biologically related. It could be that we're watching a device in an airplane and waiting until it fails. Or we work for a national laboratory and we're waiting for ordinance to uh, decay to the point where it's not effective anymore. Uh, 
Um, but originally, at least in bio applications, it had to do with how long does it take for somebody or something to die? So you might also see survival analysis described as time to event data. The, the challenge with survival data is that it is subject to this uh, statistical issue of censoring. I mentioned, uh, for example, a uh, clinical trial application where you're watching people who have AIDS and they're under a particular treatment regimen and you're curious how long they will survive. What's the average survival time or median survival time for people with this uh, illness? And just a practical issue that comes up when the, in those types of studies is you don't always get to watch until the exact event time. Some of your study participants may drop out uh, or just be lost for one reason or another. Lost to follow up is the jargon that's used. So people who are censored, <clears throat> we will focus on right censoring. What that would mean is if this person was censored, we know that they lived a certain amount of time at least, but then we don't, we don't know the actual event time. So they could have died the day after our last visit with them, or they could still be alive. We have no way of knowing. Then the challenge is, what do you do with situations like that? Do you throw out individuals for whom you don't know the actual time? Or do you treat people who were censored at a particular time as having died at that time? Neither of those are optimal choices. Throwing people out means you lose information. You're losing some of your data. If you have a clinical trial and 20% of the individuals are lost to follow up, Throwing them out loses 20% of your sample size. And people pay a lot of money to run these types of studies, so there's interest in extracting as much information as possible from the data that we have. Yeah, so what's, what would be left censoring? Um, so one setting that I'm familiar with is um, protein mass spectrometry. So mass spectrometry is uh, like have a mouse, you extract a uh, tissue sample maybe, and then it goes into a mass spectrometer and gives you these spectral data, these peaks. On the horizontal axis is a function of mass. And the interest is in where are peaks. Peaks in this spectra corresponds to, roughly speaking, pieces of a protein. So you would, you're interested in saying, here's protein A, there's protein B, there's protein C. And then quantification is done by either peak height, or area under the peak, some kind of measure of the intensity of the peak. So if you do this type of experiment, you wind up with a data set like uh, proteins in uh, one column. So like protein 1, protein 2, dot, 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 M. And for each of your sampled individuals, we'll say mice, so mouse, one, mouse, two, dot, 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 mouse, in, you have numbers. And these are peak height, maybe, or peak areas. Um, what, would, what happens often in these types of applications is you have numbers, so 20.172, 18.05, but maybe an NA here, a missing value for one of the mice. The way that you would have a missing value in this application is if the protein was not present in that mouse or if its intensity was so low that you couldn't detect it. <clears throat> 
So if you have spectral data like this, if you zoom in on the lower end, you have this kind of noisy stuff that may just be background noise or contaminants in the sample. And the algorithms are able to find peaks that are sufficiently above that noise. But if there's a peak, like a real peak, that does not rise above that lower detection limit, then you just don't have any number because it can't be detected. So in the context of uh, data like that, where there's a lower detection limit, it may be that nothing is recorded, but that doesn't necessarily mean nothing was there. In a mass spec application, often we will know what the detection limit is. I can detect peaks above some small number. And if mouse in was not observed to have this particular protein, what I really should say is mouse in had a, an abundance or an intensity no bigger than the detection limit. It's not like it wasn't necessarily there. It's not like the actual intensity was zero. It was less than or equal to the detection limit. Right censoring is the other way around. Your survival time is bigger than or equal to the last time period that I observed for you. Um, so definitely right censoring is the most common, as far as I know. But there, it is possible to have left censoring. It's also possible to have what's called interval censoring, where um, this is maybe easier to visualize, interval censoring, where you know uh, for some people they lived this long, another person lived that long, another person lived this long, and uh, another person is known to have um, let's see Let's suppose we're observing people at um, fixed time intervals. Start of the study, every so many weeks maybe. Um, if somebody was still alive at this time point, but was lost to follow up at that time point, Uh, that's not a good description. Mm. I'm not coming up with a good example off the top of my head. I'll, I'll come up with an example and post something on the discussion board. But it, uh, it's pretty rare, at least in my experience. But there are cases where you know somebody uh, or an event happened between this time point and that time point. But we don't know exactly when. So that could happen, I guess, if somebody was observed at this time point, not observed in, in between, but then we get word that they are dead at that time. But we don't know exactly when in here the death actually occurred. Kind of a more subtle case. I think it's fair to say by far the most common um, application of survival uh, methods is with right censoring. Most of the time it's a right censored observation there's also something that's a little bit different called truncation, um, which, again, is kind of related to detection limit issues. So if, for example, um, in a genomic assay where you have these wells corresponding to different uh, genomic 
entities like genes maybe. Common application would be to measure in light intensities from these things. So you extract genomic information, you let it hybridize to these arrays, and then the number that goes to gene one, say, is a, a pixel intensity of an image. See, um, how bright is the light at that image? So the images that are used to do that have an upper bound on uh, how much intensity they can hold. There can be a saturation effect where gene one is really there at X intensity but the, the assay can only go up to X minus something else intensity. So you can tell when the signal is, is uh, saturated. And if you have that kind of saturated signal issue, then it's more like a truncation issue. Um, in that there's a fixed place where you can't see anything above it or beyond it. So let me just say uh, general advice as a data analyst. Um, things to think about, things to ask your collaborators about to make sure you understand the data. One of them is, is correlation. So we always want to understand what is the nature of these different individuals or replications in my data set. Are these biological replicates or are they technical replicates? Are they repeat draws from the population or are they just repeated measurements on the same draw from the population? That's one thing you definitely want to be aware of and have the answer to. <clears throat> Another thing to have, that you want to have the answer to is uh, if we are looking at time to event data, do we have actual time to event data or do we have this censoring going on? because the person you're collaborating with may not know the statistical issue. Um, so in the context of time to event data, you always want to be thinking, do we have the actual times or is there potentially censoring going on? Just like with correlated data, if we don't account for the correlation, it can mess up our inference. We can have wrong p-values, wrong confidence intervals. With time to event data, if we don't have actual time to event and there's really censoring, we can have um, biased inference as well. I showed you a simulation on Friday with uh, simulated survival data and we saw implications on inference. Confidence intervals did not contain at uh, the rate that we claimed. When we dealt with correlated data, we had um, an additional variable that we had to keep track of, an an like an ID variable. In the orthodont data, there was that subject variable that we had to have in there in order to keep uh, repeat measurements on the same individual tied together. GLS and GEE, they need to know, we have to tell them which observations go together. With survival data, since we have this extra complication of censoring, we have an extra variable as well. So down at the bottom of this slide, this is the common uh, or the standard notation. For each individual, we have an event time. How long did you live? How long until you died under our study? But we also have an indicator variable that tells us whether or not it was an actual event time or whether it was a censored event time. So in our clinical trial, for each person we have how long did it take or how long were they under study and we need an indicator for whether that time of study resulted in death or loss to observation, loss to follow up. So we're going to represent this as TI for the event time that goes together with delta i, censoring indicator. And delta i will be equal to one if an actual event happened, if this was the actual time of death, or zero if it was censored. 
Here's a simple example. So time to death from HIV after diagnosis for five people. Subject one, time, the observed event time was five, let's say five months. The censoring indicator delta is equal to one. That means individual one was observed to die at five months. Individual two was observed for six months but that was not when they were observed to die. We did not observe their death time. Delta is equal to zero, so that person has a censored observation, right censored. Three, four, and five, those subjects were observed to have actual event times. Okay, yes? Good question. So what happens if somebody doesn't die from HIV? That's, that brings in another statistical issue of uh, um, like there's, some, there's something called competing risks. Um, if you're studying people with HIV, but they die from infection, you know, from their suppressed immune response or something like that. It's not necessarily HIV. Or they die from complications from the treatment that they're on. Um, that causes additional issues. Um, and I don't think the rule, I don't think the general rule is to treat those people as right censored. I think there's special stuff that we do with them. Let me go to the end of my notes here. I think I have something about that, competing risks. This is slide 41. So suppose we have a, a cohort of men followed for five years. Um, what, yeah, what you would do is you'd have to keep track of what was the cause of death. So um, there would be a target cause if we're studying people for cardiovascular disease. If somebody died from cancer, they didn't die from cardiovascular disease. Um, and there's a whole host of uh, additional details that can be brought to bear on that type of application. So clinical trial applications have several of these kind of um, challenges embedded in them. We'll focus on the more ideal case where I either observe your death or I observe your death due to the cause that we're studying or you were censored. Months. But would it also change the difference if we observe that subject more time and then probably you will die like on the edge or something? Uh, just real world data, it just looks like. So this could be very, yeah, this could be real world data. Time subject two came in, let's say, once a month and we evaluated them. So at six months, we observed them and they were still alive. At seven months, we did not observe them anymore. They were gone. So all we can say is they lived up to six months at least, but we didn't ever see them after that. They either stopped participating in the study, uh, you know, they stopped participating in the study for one reason or another. So a question was, should we have some uh, rules about when we stop recording our data? Um, th so th most of what we're talking about here is cases where we're specifically interested in how long until somebody dies. So when we stop recording would really be the last day that our study subjects are alive. Ideally, we would have this clinical trial going with all these people with HIV, and our study is going to be done when everybody's dead. Or at the end of some pre-specified time period. So I'm going to watch you for 10 years. Um, I have event times for everybody who died. There's some people who were lost to follow up and I have censored times. 
And then at the end of the 10 years, if some folks have not died, they're essentially censored as well, and they would be treated as censored in the analysis. Um, with survival data, because we're interested in time to death or time to event, uh, we, we will be interested in averages, like the average survival time and median survival time. But we're also going to see a couple of new uh, summary measures. We're going to talk about a survival function or a survival curve. So a survival curve would look like for these folks with HIV, say, we have time, and we have survival probability estimates. A survival function is um, S of T is the probability that time is at least T, little t. This is 1 minus a CDF, probability that t is less than or equal to t. CDF is just, one, is just the probability that the random variable is less than or equal to that. 1 minus that is probability that it's bigger than or equal to that. That's a survival function. So it's kind of a new concept for us, a survival function. Um, if you were diagnosed with cancer, one of the things your doctor would share with you is some kind of picture like this. For men with stage 5 prostate cancer in your age category with your demographics, this is the estimated survival curve. So you have, this goes from 0 to 1, you have very high probability of living out the year, say, but then here are how your probabilities play out over time. 20% probability of living five or more years or something like that. Survival curves are a commonly used summary uh, method for time to event outcomes. Means and medians are also valid. Your average survival time when in this situation is such and such. We can compute that. But uh, the first thing we're going to learn about with survival data is how to estimate survival functions or survival curves. So that's new. That will be new. And then the other thing that will be new is we're going to talk about a summary measure called a hazard. Totally new concept for us. When you do logistic regression, if you've done logistic regression, you know that part of the fun of doing logistic regression is that you have to talk in terms of odds and odds ratios. The reason for that is because uh, there's mathematically convenient ways to do regression with 0, 1 data if you talk about odds. It's a similar issue here. There are some nice techniques that are available to us with survival data. If we talk not about means, mean survival time, but about this new quantity called hazard. So we'll have to get a little comfortable with dealing with uh, regression coefficients that are not mean differences. They're differences in hazards. They're like, we'll talk about hazard ratios. Just like in logistic regression, we talk about odds ratios. So let me. Um, continue with these, this simple example and show you what a survival function looks like and how we can estimate it when we have censored data. So here's the definition of a survival function. S of t is the probability that the survival time is bigger than or equal to little t. And that could be a function of covariates x. So for your particular situation, your race, gender, gender, age, and everything, what is your covariate-specific survival function? If we did not have censoring, um, like let's look at our data here. Suppose we had 5, 6, 8, 3, 22, and they were all exact uh, survival times, event times. So 
censored survival times suppose are three five six eight twenty two three five six eight twenty two we have five individuals in our study just heuristically if you wanted to estimate what's the probability what's my estimated probability based on this sample of size five that you live um, let's let's do so here's three six nine Three, six, nine, twelve, fifteen, eighteen, twenty one, twenty four. What proportion of our sample lived um, three or more months? A survival function goes from zero to one, and a sensible estimate of the survival probability at time three would be what proportion of the people survived three or more months. With these data, everybody survived three or more. One person died at three, right at three. So we'll say they survived up to three. Mm. You might want to call this we might want to treat that person as having survived up to time three. Certainly after time three, at say time four, what's the estimated probability that you live four or more? There's four out of five who lived four or more. My estimated probability then at time four uh, would be Point eight, four out of five. At time five, I would drop down to three out of five, point six. At time six, I would drop down to two out of five, point four. At point eight, one out of five. And then that would continue until 22, at which point everybody's dead. So an estimated survival function, one way to do it is with what's called a step function, like that. If we didn't have any censoring, you could construct one of these, um, what are called empirical survival functions. By just putting a point at every place where there's an event and estimating the lo location of that point as proportion of people who are still alive at that point. So what we're going to do is try to do this type of estimate in such a way that we are able to handle cases where one or more of these are actually censored. It's a simple solution if there is no censoring. But with our data, at time six, this uh, location at time six is an issue because the person did not actually die at time six. They were lost at time six. So they, lit, they died at something greater than or equal to time six. And what we're gonna see is that we're gonna have a slightly different technique for estimating 
the survival function. If you treated that person as having actually died at time six, then you're going to uh, you're going to essentially bias your results because you're going to make it look like more people died at time six than actually happened. We need a way that takes into account the partial information for a censored individual. So let me, before we run out of time, just walk you through motivation of our first method, which is called the Kaplan-Meier survival function estimator. Um, with our data, let's note that we start at time zero, because all of our numbers were bigger than zero, we're going to start with probability that t is bigger than or equal to zero, the survival probability at zero is set equal to one. That's where we start. And now let's think about what happens at each of the event times. If I'm going to build like a step function kind of representation of a survival curve, then there's only potential changes to this function at actual event times. For example, at time three. What is the survival probability at time three? We can write this um, as the product of a conditional and a marginal probability. Specifically, um, the probability that you live at least three is the same thing as the probability you don't die at three and you survived to time three. So you living at least three is equivalent to the event, the joint event, that you didn't die before time three and you didn't die at time three. The only other option is you lived more than three. So the probability of living at least three can be written as probability, right, so let me back up real quick. I'm saying that the probability that t is at least three is the same thing as the probability um, that you survived until three and didn't die at time three. That's a joint probability, like probability of this and that. And joint probabilities can be written as uh, marginal or a conditional times marginal. So the probability of, for example, x and y is the same thing as probability of y given x times the probability of x. Basic probability result. So I can apply that result here to say that joint probability is the same thing as don't die at three, given that you survived until three, times probability that you survived till time three. The reason it's helpful to write it this way is because um, we can approximate both of these fairly easily. Okay? The, the probability, um, let, let's think about this particular person at time three. We're out of time, damn it. We'll return to this on, on Wednesday. But we're going to see how we can estimate in, without really having any kind of probability model just like we kind of heuristically built up this step function, we're going to see how we can heuristically build up a step function when there is the possibility of censoring. If you follow the next couple of slides, 
you'll see that uh, for all the uncensored individuals, we essentially are doing what we were doing with the green curve. It's when we get to censored individuals, like time six. Time three, it's just 0.8. Time five, it's 0.6, like we put on the whiteboard. But at time six, um, it changes slightly. Changes slightly, because we're not actually going to treat time six as a death. Instead of de uh, deprecating the number of people who are alive, we're not going to deprecate at time six because of the censoring. So I'll review this and tidy up a little bit, but we're going to see a survival curve estimate and a valid one with censoring. It's called the Kaplan-Meier survival curve estimate. It's been around for a long, long time one of the most highly cited stats papers ever because it, doctors use it a lot in survival analysis applications. This is the formula, and the previous slides are trying to motivate that formula. Okay, we'll pick up on Wednesday and talk more about survival data. Where we're going is not just survival curve estimates, but we want to do regression. How do we do regression with, with sensor data?